Hello everyone, it's Mark Goodacre here. Welcome to the NT Pod, a podcast all about the New Testament and Christian origins. It's episode 23, and today we're going to be asking, what is the synoptic problem? The synoptic problems always held a great fascination for me, I suppose because from quite early on I became convinced that the standard solution to the synoptic problem, the two-source theory, is actually incorrect, and I became fascinated by the fact that so many people seemed to be wedded to the two-source theory and didn't seem to pay attention to evidence that seemed to me to tell against it. But I don't want to jump ahead of myself because this is going to be the first of three podcasts on the synoptic problem. Uh, I'm running them in parallel with my New Testament course at Duke University at the moment. The first one, this one, is going to be looking at what the synoptic problem actually is, introducing it and looking at the data. The second one will then explore the triple tradition material and mark and priority. And the third will then look at double tradition material and Q. But I think one of the mistakes in the way that the synoptic problem tends to be taught and tends to be introduced in some of the introductory books on the New Testament is that people don't actually introduce the problem. I mean, it might sound like a silly thing to say, but people don't actually introduce the problem. What they do is they go straight for one of the major solutions to the problem, and then they refract all the data through that chosen solution, the two-source theory. And I think in order to understand, but also to enjoy the synoptic problem, you really need to get stuck into the actual problem itself, first of all. You need to actually work out what is going on in the Gospels and actually look at the data. And then when you've actually posed some of the questions about the synoptic problem, then you can really move on to the interesting business of how you actually solve it. So we're going to begin in this podcast with just looking at some of the key pieces of data about the synoptic problem. And to say, first of all, what it is. Well, let's take the term synoptic before we do anything else. The four Gospels are, of course, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and three of them are synoptic gospels. The three that are synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are synoptic because you can view them together. The syn bit in the synoptic means together, with or together. Optic, of course, is is look at or to do with the eye. So it means you can look at them together. That's relating to the fact that you can arrange Matthew, Mark, and Luke into a synopsis, a book which enables you to compare the three together, because Matthew, Mark, and Luke are just so similar to one another. They have a very similar order of material, they often have very close wording, and they distinguish themselves as a group from John's Gospel, which although it has a kind of a roughly parallel structure, it still has some a Gospel beginning with John the Baptist and ending with uh, the Passion. It doesn't have uh, the detailed parallels with the synoptics that they have with one another. And the thing is that these parallels in the synoptic gospels are parallels in both wording and in order. You find remarkable degree of agreement in wording, sometimes as close as 100%. And this really makes any sensible person Um, hope that doesn't sound too prejudiced, but any sensible person that's analysing the problem, it it, it makes them realise that uh, what you have here is some kind of copying of some kind. It it, it is simply, the agreement is too close for it to be the result of either kind of coincidental editing or oral traditions or, you know, something like that. There really has to be somewhere some kind of copying going on, whether from one another or from a a lost source or something like that. And the parallel in order between the three synoptic gospels is is remarkable as well. You, You see them paralleling one another in sequence from one story to another to another. And after a while, it makes you think, well, Uh, This kind of parallel sequence really has to be, again, the result of some sort of literary borrowing. Someone's borrowing from somebody else. But the issue of sorting out the data in the synoptic problem is a question, really, of sorting out the material into different types. And looking at the material in different types helps you then to realise what actually uh, is, is going on at a later stage. So we need to kind of grasp these sorts of material first. So the good news here is that it's remarkably straightforward 
to describe the basic data that you have. We can divide them up into four major groups and these four, four major groups cover pretty much 80 or 90 percent of all the material that's in the synoptics. The first group is called triple tradition and it's material that comes in Matthew, Mark and Luke. The second group is called double tradition and it's material that's only in Matthew and Luke. The, f the third group is called Special Matthew, or M, and that's material, surprisingly enough, that comes only in Matthew. And the final kind of group is Special Luke, or L, the material that comes just in Luke. Now let's take each one of those groups in turn. The first group, Triple Tradition. This material has a lot of what you'll be familiar with if you know the Synoptic Gospels. So you've got the parable of the sower in there, you've got a lot of miracles, Jairus' daughter, a woman with a hemorrhage, the stilling of the storm. You have a huge amount of the passion narrative in there. So if you're, if you're thinking of the passion narrative of, of, of Matthew, Mark and Luke, it's all, not all, but almost all uh, triple tradition material. So a triple tradition, a hugely important grouping here. And one of its special characteristics is that it seems to have something to do with Mark's gospel. In other words, Mark is specially the mediating factor here. People use the term middle term, that Mark is in some sense, in this triple tradition material, the middle term. And what that means is that where you get the three synoptics all agreeing together in these pericopes, usually the agreements are between Matthew and Mark, or between Mark and Luke, or between all three. You relatively rarely get agreements between Matthew and Luke against Mark in this material. So Mark is some kind of mediating figure. And it's not just in the wording, but also in the order. Where Matthew and Luke apparently depart from Mark's order, it isn't usually for very long. And if they do depart from Mark's order, they come back again. And they rarely depart from Mark's order together. So when you're looking at this triple tradition material, you really have to notice the extent to which Mark is the middle term, the mediating term across those three synoptic gospels. But what about those other kind of material that I mentioned? Double tradition is the next one I mentioned. And the double tradition is the material in Matthew and Luke. It's about 200 or 250 verses, nowhere near as large a set of material as the triple tradition. But um, it has some of the most memorable material in. You'll find the Lord's Prayer in there. You'll find the Beatitudes in there. In fact, you'll find quite a lot of what turns up in Matthew's Sermon on the Mount in this double tradition material. You'll find also one or two narratives like the centurion's boy or the messengers from john the baptist the temptation story but most of it does tend to be sayings material of one kind or another and that fact itself might be significant when we get to the next couple of podcasts when we start analyzing this sort of data so the double tradition matthew and luke parallel material the interesting thing about that material is that you don't have very much of it in a really closely parallel order. There is some kind of parallel order, but it's not like the order that you get in the triple tradition. That also could be interesting, and we'll come on to that in due course. I then mentioned also Special Matthew and Special Luke, and I said, of course, that they are self-explanatory in many ways. Special Matthew is a curious group of material. Like the double tradition, it's... A lot of it is sayings material. There are exceptions. You've got things like the coin in the fish's mouth in Matthew 17. And you've got other pieces that seem to get kind of embedded within triple tradition material, like Pilate's wife dream, which is very much it's stuck in the middle of a good triple tradition bit of material. But otherwise, special Matthew is mainly things like the parables of the ten virgins or it's the parable of the sheep and the goats which occur in Matthew 25. It's quite rich in general in parable material. Special Lucan material is many people's favourite group of material of all because it features within it some of the most famous and some of the best loved stories in the Gospels. So you have the Good Samaritan in Luke 10, 25 to 37, or you have the Prodigal Son in Luke 15. You have what I regard as probably the most beautifully written story anywhere in the Synoptic Gospels, which is the Road to Emmaus story in Luke chapter 24, where two disciples are walking with Jesus, but they don't realise they're walking with Jesus until gradually he explains the scriptures and then he sits with them and shares a Last Supper. So 
What you have in Special Luke is beautiful storytelling, which may be of, again, some real interest as we kind of unravel what's going on with all these different kinds of material that we'll see. So that's a brief introduction to the different kinds of material in the synoptics and the first point of trying to analyse the synoptic problem. But I'll add before I finish one or two other key points. One of them is that just about every category that we've mentioned has some kind of blurring, some kind of difficulty, some kind of complication. And every time with the synoptic problem that you think you've grasped all the key data, you'll suddenly find that there's something else. Oh my goodness, I hadn't realised that there's this whole group of material. But it's important to grasp some of those key pieces of data first before you move on to, to the kind of complications that we will get to. Another thing that is worth pointing out is the sheer importance of the observation about Mark as the middle term. Because when you look at that triple tradition material and you see the extent to which Mark is the mediating term between Matthew and Luke, the kind of common denominator if you like, that's when you think to yourself this must be a key fact that in some way helps us to work out a solution to the synoptic problem. And so next time in the next episode of the NT Pod, we're going to look at mark as the middle term and ask whether it's a group of data, a, a set of material that makes better sense on the assumption that mark is the first gospel to be written or whether it's better understood as the third gospel to be written. Well thanks very much for listening to the latest episode of the NT Pod. It's always good to have your company. You can find me on the web at podacre.blogspot.com. You can look for me on Jukes iTunes U or you can Google for me at uh, the NT Pod. Oh and as Columbo would say, one more thing. Because this is a topic of interest to me, the synoptic problem, I thought I'd release on this occasion a couple of extended episodes of the NT pod. I'm not putting them out on the normal feed, so if you're an iTunes subscriber or a Duke iTunes U subscriber, you'll need to go over to my website at podacre.blogspot.com. That's P-O-D-A-C-R-E dot blogspot.com. And then you can pick up the 40-minute version of this episode. What uh, I'm, I do over there is I simply take uh, a, a recent class that I've given at uh, Duke and edit it a little bit and uh, put it out uh, as, as an episode, as an extended extra episode of the NT Pod, should you wish to listen to it. But I'll be along again soon, both with the normal NT Pod and another extended version. Thanks again for listening. <laughs>